right, so welcome everyone to our event with uh, Michelle Soulier, Soulier <clears throat> whose book Bigfoot in Maine is out now. Uh, Michelle lives in Portland. She's the owner of the Green Hand Bookshop. This is her second book. Her first book, Strange Maine, uh, came out a few years ago, and she also runs the blog Strange Maine. She um, also used to share space with the International Cryptozoology Museum, whose founder, Lauren Coleman, is one of the nation's foremost Bigfoot researchers. And it's a place I have visited and I really love it there. So I'd like you all to welcome her and Michelle, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna start out with a few questions. I sent you this list. I have a lot of questions to ask because I'm actually really interested in Bigfoot. But the first thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, do you remember what first got you interested in strange things and in Bigfoot in particular? Um, quite honestly, and not saying this just because uh, the Thompson Free Library is hosting this, but I honestly, it was at the library that I got interested in interesting things uh, that were not what might be considered the, the norm. Um, I used to go to the Riverton branch of the Portland Public Library when I was a kid and had a great time going through all their books about UFOs and ghosts and the Loch Ness Monster and all that stuff. So I definitely started young uh, reading about stuff like that. And then, you know, as I got a little older, I started reading Omni Magazine and getting more interested in the scientific end of things as well. Um, so it's, it's, it started early. <laughs> yeah, I always, um, I have a similar story because I think it's just that the weird books, like all of the cryptozoology and UFOs, aliens, ghosts, all of those kind of things, they're always, if you use Dewey, they're right at the beginning. So they're like zero, zero, one, zero, zero, two. So yes, I always sure. say that it's like the strange, lazy kids who gravitate <laughs> towards that. And that pretty much describes me in like middle school and high school. I would be, you know, I wouldn't make it much past the Bigfoot books or the alien books, the ghost books. And they're the most interesting anyways. So I have a similar story. <laughs> so on that topic, have you, have you done any research into the theories that Bigfoot might be an alien or an interdimensional being? And do you give any credence to that? And have you had any accounts from people who thought that? Um, I've definitely talked to people who are curious about correlations between Bigfoot activity and UFO activity. Um, I haven't talked to anybody that I, that's told me um, that they're convinced the two are intertwined, but I definitely know there's some curiosity around coinciding events. Um, I... I haven't encountered anything like that. So it's kind of going to have to wait on the table <laughs> until yeah. if and when something like that occurred. Um, my approach has been that uh, Bigfoot is, you know, if it's here in Maine, is a biological creature, you know, living alongside the black bears and the moose and everything else. Um, because everybody I've talked to that um, whose accounts appear in the book, um, it's a very, it's a pretty straightforward encounter. And I think a lot of them feel the same way. It's just another main mammal that doesn't happen to be on the lists of the known species of the state. Okay. Um, so how do you think that a creature that large could live in large enough numbers to sustain a population while still remaining undetected? And why do you think Maine is a good state for that? Um, I would say it's, you know, a, a certain reclusiveness uh, and, an avoid, and in general, an avoidance of contact with humans, because I think we can probably all agree that humans are a fairly dangerous species when you run into them in the woods, <laughs> especially if they're, you know, most of the people or a large part of the people who are out in the woods are either hunting um, or armed because they know there are black bears out there um, and other large animals that might become aggressive. Um, Maine has uh, just huge swaths of forested land that are still linked 
um, making really convenient greenways for large for animals to move through um, under tree cover. And Maine also has a substantial network of water sources all across the state. So, you know, ponds, lakes, brooks, streams, rivers, uh, because of the glacial activity that carved the shape of the state, there's water that utilizes all of those little funny nooks and crannies that are scattered all across the map for us. So um, I think those are the two crucial elements that Maine um, brings to make a good environment for a large creature like this to exist here. And the fact that so little of the state is heavily populated mm -hmm. is a huge uh, boon if they're trying to avoid human contact. If you look at a population density map of Maine, the population clusters up the uh, southern coast. And then there's another center that runs up through Bangor and then up uh, to Roostook County along the Maine highway drag there. So the, the rest of the state has either no population or very low population density. Um, I think the other spot there's a little collection of uh, populated areas is along the New Hampshire border um, mm -hmm. when there, where there's a lot of back and forth between those two states. So yeah. if you want to avoid people, you just go where there aren't any. It's pretty easy. Yeah, I think um, Piscataquis County has one of the lowest population densities in the eastern part of the U.S. So if he's going to hide somewhere, it's not a bad place, you know. Um, <clears throat> so do you think that Bigfoot, and you may not have an opinion on this, but in the people you've talked to or some of the research you've done, do you think that Bigfoot might be an extinct hominid like Gigantopithecus or Paranthropus, or do you think he's a descendant of those creatures? It's, in, it's entirely possible. Um, I'm not an anthropologist, so mm -hmm. I can't say for sure, but I know that um, Jeff Meldrum has a lot of theories about that, and, and also he has a lot of opinions about how up until the current era, anthropology has been restricted to a specific type of vision of how things happened. Um, and he would really, it sounds from what he was saying when he spoke at the International Cryptozoology Conference a few years ago, he would re really like to see a younger generation of anthropologists rethink some of that and open up thinking to a variety of ways that things evolve um, in the natural world over history um, because he thinks uh, the current view is a very linear view. You know, one thing leads to another and there are possibilities for other branches and anomalies that just aren't being taken into account um, until, until the proof becomes irrefutable and then <laughs> Hopefully someday things will get sorted out, but um, but like I said, I don't have I don't have that kind of education to know to be able to speak clearly on that myself. But I would recommend people would look at uh, Jeff, Dr. Jeff Meldrum's work if they want to know more about some of those ideas. Okay, um, going along with that a little bit. Um... There's been a lot of talk. I know I've heard a lot of it. You've probably heard a lot as well of what would it actually take to convince the world that Bigfoot exists. Some people think that you would literally have to shoot a Bigfoot and bring it in. Other people have said, you know, maybe a really good picture or a DNA sample. What, in your opinion, having talked to some people who study this, do you think it would take to convince the entire world that Bigfoot actually exists? Um, I think DNA is crucial, obviously. Um, and I know that uh, some of the longtime investigators on the West Coast, uh, Peter Byrne and Robert Morgan, uh, both heavily advocated not killing a specimen, um, instead using uh, trank guns and then acquiring specimens from it. So they believed that we could find um, a specimen and not have to destroy it in the process. Um, 
but I think, you know, in, a, in some ways, there, the scientific community is so far away from accepting anything like this without a body on the slab mm -hmm. that that might be the only way that the presence of Bigfoot is acknowledged yep. by them. So um, I myself can't see the point of, you know, slaughtering something to prove it exists. Um, and I think a lot of people who have encountered um, these, these creatures don't want that to happen. And in fact, most of them have basically said, you know, I know what I saw. I know it exists. I don't need it to, I don't need to prove it to anybody. Um, and that's, and that's where they leave it. So, um, but I think uh, the promise of eDNA, which is the environmental DNA, um, which uh, was another uh, talk at the International Cryptozoology Conference a few years ago, um, Todd DeSatel mentioned that, you know, eDNA has come a long way and that allows you to collect samples from water and soil in an area and determine what creatures have been there over the course of many, many years. Um, so there is hope that eDNA will accomplish at least a step in the right direction um, and help ensure that the scientific community if proof, if proof is found in eDNA, might take further steps to do field studies in that region. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree that we, you probably should not kill a Bigfoot just to prove that a Bigfoot exists. Um, I am kind of skeptical if the scientific community would accept certain things, um, just because you said, how do you, or maybe not, you're not necessarily an anthropologist. You aren't really a scientist. You're just collecting stories in this book. But how do the people that you've worked with, how do they balance um, looking at this from a scientific and an anthropological standpoint with still dealing with cryptozoology? Because in, in the field of cryptozoology, there's a, it's a large spectrum of people that study it and that have an interest in it. So how do they try to stay scientifically grounded and anthropologically grounded while still studying such a kind of out there subject? Um, I mean, obviously some of the people that I talked to, they hope to never encounter something like this again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. It wasn't on their list of things they wanted to do and it happened anyways. So they're not, I think a lot of them aren't thinking in terms of what the scientific ramifications of it are. Uh, those who have found themselves wondering more and more about it and who are continuing, continuing to be interested in what investigators are finding, um, I think at this point, many of them are focusing more on methods of tracking, uh, methods of getting close to them. Um, and finding where they're spending time. So they're thinking in a strategic way, um, not so much necessarily about the biology beyond, you know, if a creature needs to eat certain things that are available at a certain time of year in a certain place, we can probably find them if we go there. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the Maine Bigfoot Foundation, uh, which is headed up in part by Janelle Graff, who is her account, her family's accounts are in one of those chapters. Um, they are trying to take an approach that allows them to potentially collect samples, um, biological samples. So they're trying to figure out ways similar to what the black bear biologists would use to um, extract DNA samples without having to restrain the creature. So in other words, finding ways to attract them to certain locations or figure out what locations they go to regularly and then use some of the methods that the black bear biologists have been using to try to get hair samples or or other or other bodily traces so there are there are some people who are seriously considering what it would take to provide proof okay um, a lot of the more compelling things in the book is 
you have a lot of eyewitness accounts and you interview eyewitnesses and you talk to them and you do a lot of research on top of that. So the individual accounts in the book are really tremendous in that they're very local, some of them to hear, and it's real people that you've really sat down and interviewed and they've had real experiences. Um, the closest one to Dover Foxcroft is actually from a really long time ago, so you didn't get a chance to interview anyone. But um, there was an account of an ape man body that was recovered in Greenville, which is fairly close up there at Moosehead Lake. Um, did you have any details from that in addition that you wanted to share or anything that you wanted to talk about with that case? Oh, that is one that haunts me. Um, there was, there used to be an online chat board uh, called, I think it was called like topics.net or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I found a few eyewitnesses there that I eventually within a few years of trying, managed to get a hold of. But another person that posted on that site would um, was doing similar research to my own on the historic end. Um, and they would post a lot of the historic stories from the 1800s, et cetera, that I was familiar with already. Um, but one of the ones they posted was a brief mention that an ape-like body had been found near the train tracks. I think was it Greenville, I think is the, yeah, the yeah. town they mentioned was closest. Um, but they didn't, none of the stuff they were mentioning had directly attributed sources. So I couldn't go and find the material and double check it myself. And I've searched for that <laughs> through so many digital archives. Um, using different keywords, trying to find stuff. Um, and I have yet to come up with anything. And I still hold out hope. That's on my short list of cases that someday I hope I will still stumble across something uh, that will tell me more about that story. Um, and one of the interesting things about doing working on this project for so long, it's been over a decade that I've been working on this project, is that with the passage of time, uh, more things come together. Uh, some of the eyewitnesses I spoke to, it took me years to actually track the person down and get a hold of them and get them to agree to talk to me. Um, so I find that, you know, I'm in it for the long game. I'm in it for the long haul. Um, I'm going to keep looking into this. So I'm hoping <laughs> that yeah. by continuing to sort of ping away and look under all the haystacks and all of that eventually that I will find the clipping that that refers to and let me tell you I will celebrate that day. <laughs> yeah the, the account in reading it seemed kind of weird because it seemed like farther away papers picked it up but then mm -hmm. I don't I don't think the Bangor paper had anything about it in there. Um, if you wanted to we actually at the library have the Piscatus Quiz observers which I think should include that that you could check it out on our website. Oh really? But that might be a break in the case. That would be really exciting. Yeah, I would yeah. love to to dig around in there. Yeah, <laughs> I spent um, a lot of time just chasing loose ends. <laughs> I know that was a, that was a time in history, though, in 1886, where there were a lot of just plain false trying to sell paper accounts, though. So I was I was kind of skeptical when I read it, and I knew it was from that time period. Yeah, um, I mean, so that one. I think what was most interesting about it was because it coincided time-wise very closely to the um, the Waterboro um, small ape man that um, J. W. McHenry found um, near uh, near Thomaston, I think. Right? Is that yeah, Thomaston Waldebaro area? So, so because of the time uh, matching fairly closely that was of particular interest yeah so. okay um another account that really fascinated me was um Susie's account from Kennebec mm -hmm. County yeah um which actually has a documentary made about it called Harry Man My Life with Bigfoot which I need to track down and watch I didn't get to watch it yet oh it it's it's very compelling and yeah, I highly recommend that everybody watch it if they get a chance. Uh, it's on the Lincoln County uh, Community Television Station's website, um, and it's it's fascinating. 
and sometimes heartbreaking. So. Um, in that, that case, uh, if, if you wanted to go into a little more detail about that case, it was a young girl who had multiple encounters. That was what really struck me about it was that some of these encounters were a brief glimpse in the woods and they don't know what they saw, but this young girl had, see, had seen and actually lived with Bigfoot for years. And there was just yeah. something that happened around her home. Um, and you got to interview her in person. Do you have any more details to add about that? Uh, sure. Uh, for those who haven't read the book, um, Susie, you know, in her very young years, I'm trying to remember how old she was at the beginning of it, but very little, like early grade school age. Um, she, her family, her mom and her stepdad moved to a very remote home. Um, I think she said there were only two or three other houses on the road that they lived on and, uh, and then other camps that were only populated during the summer. So it was, you know, pretty typical for remote Maine in which it was, you know, near a body of water, near a pond um, and set back in a really rustic environment. And her parents uh, entertained a lot because it was remote and her dad was kind of a mover and a shaker and tied to the, I think she said tied to the liquor industry in some way. Um, so they would have people over for cocktail parties in the evening and her mom would just send her out in the backyard to play, which, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, I know I definitely spent lots of time outdoors without parental supervision. So it's, you know, to today's kids, it would probably sound shockingly um, unsupervised, but that was, things were done a little differently then. But, um, you know, she was out there as it started getting darker, um, as her parents were hosting this cocktail party, and she would feel like she was being watched by something and eventually uh, saw what was watching her. And it was a very tall uh, bipedal figure. Um, it didn't seem threatening at all to her. Um, it just was sort of almost like it was keeping an eye on her while she was out there by herself. And so when she was out playing on her own, because there were no other kids in the neighborhood, um, she encountered it more and more and eventually they struck up a rapport and uh and her her story continues on with um them actually becoming almost like a supplemental family unit um he the the large hairy bipedal figure he she started calling him wabu um he had a, a female mate and a small uh small child as well um and he didn't bring them to see her as often but every now and then um they would all spend time nearby i think she um at one point she tried to teach him how to play cards but he just wasn't he didn't see the point of it um you know things like that um her dad would throw half smoked cigarettes on the ground outside and babu would find them and tear the paper off it and eat the leftover tobacco. Um, there's so many little details of what she encountered during those years, because this went on for several years as she grew older and became um, a young teenager before her family kind of, her own family kind of imploded and she and her mother uh, took off away from the not so great situation with her stepfather. So. Um, it's a really compelling story. And, and again, I recommend everybody watch the, uh, the documentary that was made by Lincoln County Television, um, where the, uh, the producer interviews her because it's, it's very compelling. It's not sensational. And she's simply telling you what she experienced in her own words. I was curious when I, did, you, did she say anything about where the name Wabu came from? Was it something that she just made up? Was it something that the creature said anything, any indication of where that came from? I think she might have based it on some noises he made. Um, okay. I'm trying to remember from when we talked um, or one of one of the, the times we talked, I think she mentioned it had something to do with that. Um, they, you know, there were definitely vocalizations involved when she went outside and there was nobody around, she would, you know, 
make certain noises to let him know she was out there alone. And if he was around, he would come hang out with her um, or he might be off and she wouldn't see him at all. So, and I have a feeling, I seem to remember that it might be something similar to some sounds that he had made at some point, mm -hmm. but I can't, I can't say for sure. I'd have to ask her. <laughs> um, another one of the really compelling uh, eyewitness accounts to me was Mike from Brunswick. Mm -hmm. And what I found fascinating about him was he was kind of an outdoorsman. I mean, he was a hunter. He did a lot of hiking. He just spent a lot of time in the woods yeah. and he encountered a group a large group of Bigfoot in the woods. And after a few, a few brief encounters, he started to actually study them. And he was using techniques from Jane Goodall and from primatologists like her. And it was just fascinating how he was trying to establish like a dominance hierarchy and communicate with them in some ways. How was interviewing him? And did he have any additional things to add about that or? Um, yeah, his story, uh, Mike Ledbury's story is very, very interesting. Um, he was a teenager when all this happened. He was in high school, um, spent a lot of time out there roaming and hiking in the woods just on his own and, you know, prided himself on his ability to be able to sneak up on animals undetected. Um, and when he first started encountering the, um, the creatures that lived in the woods around his home, or at least passed through there regularly, he he was really he you know he tried doing different things to try to figure out what they were because they didn't they didn't fit any of the large mammals he knew from the area mm -hmm. um and i think at one point he talked about how he they were always following him through the woods and so one day he decided he wanted to try to follow them and so he could hear one of them um behind him and so he sort of turned around and started chasing it thinking you know I'm a track and field guy I can run like lightning I should be able to catch this thing mm -hmm. and he tried and the thing just took off went I think it was like up and over a hill there are a lot of ridges in that area and he could not he could not catch him and to him that told him this is not this is not a human being that I'm chasing because I would have caught any human <laughs> so yeah. he's like this is something different um, and that was before he had actually caught a full, a full body glimpse of one of them. So, but yeah, his, you know, his mom, I think he said his mom subscribed to National Geographic. They were always watching the specials on TV. Um, a lot of us that grew up in the seventies did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it occurred to him that, you know, he could take this information because Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey and all those guys were really good at communicating you know, through National Geographic and, and the articles about them and the interviews, what the little things they were doing that allowed them that sort of entree into the primate society that they were studying. And it was, you know, first you watch them to learn what they're doing. And then you try to, you know, explain to them through those same gestures or behaviors that you're not threatening, that you're interested in interacting with them. Um, and so he took what they had learned and tried to apply it because near as he could figure it, these were primates as well. And so chances were they used some of the same tendencies and behaviors to interact with each other. And so he tried stuff like when he did have that big, you know, the, the big encounter at the end where he encountered a bunch of them at once, he, you know, he started out like, you know, putting himself into a submissive posture, just like any other primatologist would have done when first encountering uh, primates in the wild. And, you know, at first that, that went well until he, uh, he, uh, <laughs> he was countered by a very young and aggressive uh, member of the family who was not interested <laughs> in interacting with him yeah. and viewed him as a threat and probably a rival too, because he, they were, the, the young one was a little bit, he was definitely a little bit larger than him, but he, it struck him as like the, probably also like a teenager, like a, you know, a young male trying to prove his abilities in protecting the family and chasing away the outsider. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm always I'm always impressed with these accounts where people have ongoing continued contact. And especially in, in Mike's case where he was able to, it was almost like um, a lot of people have a, an encounter and it's like a very short, brief glimpse. It's like mm -hmm. a dream almost. And it's yeah. almost like he was lucid dreaming and that he could keep going back to it and then like kind of play with it and see what he could do. And I think he did quit after that pretty heated encounter because he realized that those things could just tear him apart. But it was fascinating to hear him try to uh, do, try to figure out what was actually going on and try to communicate and interact with these beings. Yeah, so. it's, it's really interesting. And I think, I think that the, the culminating experience with the group of them occurred right around the same time he was finishing high school and getting ready to go into the military. Mm -hmm. So I, I often wonder what would have happened if he hadn't left town, if he had stayed there, would he have yeah. left? Yeah, it was one of those after I was done, I was like, oh no, you should have stayed and you should have figured out more. <laughs> he could have cracked the case. But, yeah. uh, but, but like he said, he thought, you know, nobody would listen to him because he was a kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he assumed that some adults in the scientific community would be finding similar encounters and eventually, and you know, before long have proof out for everybody. So he just thought the adults were going to take care of it, you know, which yeah. as a kid, that's kind of how things are set up. They're definitely, you know, the adults are not going to listen to you. They're just going to think you're making up stories. So yeah, that was, that was something that came through through the book too. There were a lot of accounts where people didn't tell anyone for a long time or they told people and then everyone thought they were crazy, but then neighbors started coming to them with stories. Yeah. So it's, no one wants to be seen as a, the crazy person that saw Bigfoot. So no. that does sound pretty no. great to me personally, but most people aren't up for that. Yeah, and I think especially in Maine where there are so many small towns, like even Portland where I live, it's, it's too small town in a lot of ways. You're always running into yeah. people you didn't want to see. <laughs> you know, a lot of people who know your business that you're like, how did you find that out? Um, mm -hmm. And I can only imagine that in the smaller towns, that effect is magnified a thousandfold. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that kind of happened with the other account I wanted to talk about, which was Janelle from Skowhegan, mm -hmm. which you had mentioned that she, you had mentioned her earlier that she's still continuing some Bigfoot research. Yeah, absolutely. that was actually that was actually a multi generational um, sightings like she has seen things her father has seen things and her father was a pretty well respected member of the community and mm -hmm. wasn't your typical you know he had friends in law enforcement he was well known around town and he still came forward and they still um the people you talk to trusted him like the law enforcement officials they didn't necessarily say well we believe him now we believe in bigfoot but they think that he's a trustworthy person and a respectable person so yeah that, that was another account that really I, I, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, the uh, the the game wardens and the law enforcement people that responded, um, you know, the ones that the one that I talked to said, you know, without fail, they knew he had seen something, mm -hmm. and it scared the heck out of him. And he was a woodsman that would never have been scared by anything. Yeah. Um, he would have spent all he, like he worked in the woods that was his livelihood um and his family had done for you know however many years before that so um and i think that when you're in a community when it's especially when it's a small community the the law enforcement and the and the game wardens who are part of the law enforcement there you know they get to know who is on the up and up and you know even though her dad's uh, CV handle was, uh, I think, what was it? The, the careful poacher. Yes, <laughs> so they knew he that. was up to stuff on his own, um, but they also knew that he was a straightforward guy and, and you know, had no interest in, in beating around the bush or making up stories about something. Mm -hmm. So, and that was really clear. They held him in high esteem. Um, so has, has, you said Janelle, she's still involved in Bigfoot research and Bigfoot lore and Mm -hmm. And how long has that been? How long has she been doing that since? I think was that story from the seventies. I can't remember yeah. offhand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Janelle so it's been like almost fifty years now that she's been. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I think in the interim years, she just sort of quietly kept collecting accounts from people in the area, and mm -hmm. and I should ask her what really clicked because it seems like in the last five years or so she she 
gain some sort of momentum that pushed her into taking a more active role. Um, she had struggled with uh, reporting the story to the BFRO, which is the Bigfoot Research Organization, which is the, the big national uh, organization that has a website that most people report their sightings to and was basically brushed off by them, unfortunately. Um, and I think that maybe that is what pushed her to start taking a more active role because, you know, as, as she said a million times, you know, she knew, she knows what she saw. Um, and she knows what her dad saw and what her uncle saw and her neighbors saw. And so um, growing up with that certainty about their experiences in the face of ridicule in the press at the time. Uh, there were newspaper articles which had a bit of a tinge of uh, derision to them where, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't great for them, but they persisted and they held firm in what they had seen. And because of the way they had been treated, the way, by the way her family had been treated, other people in the neighborhood who encountered strange things they couldn't explain started coming to their house to tell them their own stories because there was no way they were gonna to go to the press or the authorities after the way her family had been treated. Um, so she had years and years of that kind of information building up. And when I met with her and she drove me around that whole area and we just drove past place after place where she was like, this is where so-and-so encountered this. This is where so-and-so saw that. This is where something ran out in front of them on the road here. And this is where, you know, and it was just the whole area up around Skowhegan is, and, and Canaan is just peppered with um, locations where over the last, like you said, five decades, people have been seeing something that doesn't fit the bill of any of the large main mammals. And they're continuing to encounter stuff like that. Um, she started the main Bigfoot Foundation site on Facebook. Um, and I think they have, a, they have a regular website now too as well um, because she felt like there wasn't a good place for people to report their encounters in Maine um, where they would actually get listened to and taken seriously. And she wanted to fix that. Um, and I think that was her driving motivation and uh, as a result, they're, they're collecting new accounts and they're hoping to put a database together and get organized. And uh, they've been doing small expeditions in a few kind of hotspot areas and uh, having some really interesting encounters there themselves. So she's trying to do it as a very uh, democratic and straightforward uh, group effort, which is tough tough to pull off, but she's got a good crowd around her that supports her. And it would, it would be really interesting to see what they come up with over the next few years, because I th what is it? The, their uh, slogan is a uh, species recognition, one foot step at a time, one step at a time. Yeah. Species recognition, <laughs> one step at a time. So their, you know, their whole goal is to establish the fact that what all these people have been encountering is an actual being that is there physically present and lives in the woods around them so okay um i am going to open up the chat here in a little bit and take some questions from the audience but first i wanted to ask you um what other cryptids do you think are real what are you convinced is real and which do you think are absolute fakes <laughs> um oh gosh well there's I mean, there are obvious fakes like the Wolfertinger, which is a, a, a German cryptid that's sort of along the lines of the American jackalope, um, okay, yeah. which is basically very creative people using taxidermy to create these funny little animals that make great tchotchkes for tourists to buy. Mm -hmm. um, for real cryptids, uh, there are lots and lots of stories about uh, sea monsters and lake monsters that I find really fascinating. Um, I know some of them are probably simply creatures we did not have identification 
before at the time, like the ore fish and stuff like that. But I also wonder what else is out there that we haven't encountered yet. Uh, the giant squid has been very elusive and difficult to get footage of and or you know to get specimens that aren't completely degraded by decomposition um, but in recent years there has been uh, a growing body of evidence uh, no pun intended <laughs> for the giant squid so i think that's phenomenal because if you had told somebody that the giant squid exists like with eyes the size of dinner plates like who would believe that <laughs> but it no. does so yeah my my wife plays a lot of animal crossing and so I saw an oar fish on there. Oh, and yeah. I said, that that that's not real. That that's not a real fish. It but is. It looks it looks like something that should not exist, but it's absolutely real. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating. They're the weirdest. Like that, it's a sea serpent. Like yeah. that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's basically if if you look at some some of the medieval and like Renaissance paintings of sea serpents, it's just an oar fish. Yeah. You know, so that's one that's actually real. I know Lauren at the museum. He has as his mascot the coelacanth, which mm -hmm. was extinct for millions of years until they found them in the early 1900s so that's kind of for the cryptozoologists that's like their see i told you it could happen you know kind yeah, of animal. yeah giant panda mountain gorillas all you know all of these were creatures that everybody had heard rumors of but didn't believe existed until yeah. eventually somebody brought a specimen out and or, or and or spent large amounts of time with a population so I, th I think the natural world is full of amazing things that we have not fully discovered yet, which is really exciting to me. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, open up the chat. If anyone has any questions, you can put it in the chat. But Michelle, real quick, uh, while people are thinking of their own questions, are you still doing research? Do you think you'll do a second book about Bigfoot? Do you think there's more to write? Yeah, I've already interviewed three or actually four or more people um, with their own accounts um, and stories they've collected from other people. So I think a volume two is definitely in the works. Um, so I would love to hear from anybody who's encountered something they can't explain. Um, I'm definitely still uh, interested in documenting that and getting the oral history down on in paper and ink so that you know future generations can read about it. And you know, and other people who have had inexplicable encounters can read about it and see how it compares to their own, and and know that they're not alone in having encountered something that nobody else thought existed. Um, so yeah, a volume two is definitely <laughs> it's I've, it's going to happen. So a lot a lot quicker than the first volume did because I've 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 got an idea a better idea of what I'm doing now. So. Okay, so we have a few questions that just came in. Uh, the first one says, do you think it's possible for humans and Bigfoot or other supernatural beings to have a friendly or neutral relationship? Do you think they can live in peace? Basically, Alan wants to know. Um, I think in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. Uh, I know there are plenty of people who are uh, reportedly uh, establishing i guess what they call a habituation relationship with mm -hmm. local populations that live near them much like mike ledbury and susie did in the in the accounts in my book um so there are definitely people who are interested in having an active relationship with uh these creatures as their neighbors and are able to establish at least you know i guess you would call it a, a nodding acquaintance or a gift giving acquaintance um that that is ongoing in some locations. Um, but there are other places where um, people move into a property and they meet with uh, a territorial pushback from the woods uh, that doesn't go as well. Um, so I think it all depends on the people and the creatures involved. Uh, I think it's something that's like everything else is gonna be on a case by case basis. So. I'm, it would be nice to think that everybody could get along, but we all know that <laughs> that's yeah. not how it always goes. <laughs> um, so Sarah, my friend from Pennsylvania asks, Michelle, do you have your own Bigfoot experience or what was the moment and story when you realized you believed in Bigfoot? Um, um, I unfortunately have not had a Bigfoot experience myself yet, at least. Um, and I think it was it was in the process of talking to all the eyewitnesses uh, that 
um, are in the book. Uh, speaking to people about their encounters, um, hearing their voices as they related their encounters, which in many cases changed their lives, um, changed their view of the world uh, drastically. Um, that That is what compels me to keep inquiring about this and keep recording all the different accounts. Um, because I hope that, you know, even if we don't have biological proof yet that's accepted by the scientific community, at least familiarizing people with the idea that there are people encountering these things and interacting with them in some cases and, you know, how, how we can do that in a way that doesn't do damage to either side, I think is a great uh, hope of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like everybody to get along. Um, okay, so a friend, Tom Francois, who's from the Green Mountain State asked, do you think Champ the Lake Monster would be friends with Bigfoot? Also, <laughs> do you think Bigfoot could beat a Wendigo? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, oh, okay. Well, let's start with Champ. Um, I don't know. They they could be friends. Why not? I know uh, from talking to Susie and other people that um, Bigfoot seem to be uh, pretty enthusiastic about eating freshwater clams uh, and hanging out uh, in the shallow waters and, and marshy areas around uh, bodies of water. And, you know, maybe they bump into something else in the water from time to time. That would be an interesting... Uh, <laughs> an interesting premise for a for a book um and uh and i would not want to wager on either side uh, mm -hmm. with the bigfoot and wendigo throw down i think i think that champ could eat a bigfoot i think i, I envision like bigfoot looking for fish and clams and stuff along the lake champlain there and champ just taking it under and bigfoot's gone so it would depend I, I, on how I don't I'm not I'm not an optimist on this Quinn and Emily that uh Champ and Bigfoot would be friends. I, I so. think it would depend how good of a swimmer yeah. that particular Bigfoot was. Yeah. That's the um Godzilla versus King Kong that we should see is Champ versus Bigfoot. If Hollywood's listening. <laughs> It'll happen, I'm sure. Um, Tristan asks, do you think the Bigfoot species in Alaska is around nine feet tall? Do you know anything about the Bigfoot species in Alaska? There are some really interesting accounts that come out of Alaska. Um, I have a feeling that the rugged environment creates rugged individuals. And mm -hmm. so I wouldn't be surprised if there are some larger, older creatures there. Um, it would make sense. And especially because I know the strength implied by some of the accounts would, it would be reasonable to expect a, a much larger specimen to be creating those, those disruptions in the natural world. Okay. Um, Bobby asks, do you think that the oral history slash folklore of accounts of Bigfoot have mythologized the notion of such a creature? leading to skepticism of its existence? Or is the oral history responsible for the quest for biological proof? Uh, I mean, there's definitely been a longstanding mythological basis, uh, folkloric basis for all of this. Uh, we have always, humans have always been fascinated by those we perceive as giants. Uh, so I think that's, that has deep, deep roots in our, you know, archetypal, mythology as a rate as a as a species um i definitely think that the anecdotal evidence the personal experiences that have been you know more and more of them have been going on record since the you know 50s and 60s when public awareness of it started on the west coast and expanded outwards um, i think the cumulative effect of all those accounts and all those people stepping forward and saying, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, um, this is what I encountered. I think 
a lot of that has culminated in shows like Finding Bigfoot, which I mean, I know people love to laugh at Finding Bigfoot, but it did bring the conversation into everybody's living room. And so I think by doing that, it's shifted the gears a little bit more towards a general acceptance of discussion of it without just, you know, completely scoffing and brushing it off. Um, it's generated conversations with genuinely interested ideas, you know, people trying to figure out what needs to be done to uh, create a body of evidence that the scientific community will engage with finally. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot that's been going on in the last decade or so that seems to be pushing us towards a position where we'll be in a much better place to accept it generally if we suddenly are presented with concrete evidence that is irrefutable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Nancy asks, Ethan Adams had a positive article in the Midcoast newspaper. Do you usually get similar positive news articles about your work? How's the press been about the book so far? Uh, the press about the book has been really good so far, and I've actually been very surprised. Um, I expected a lot more um, ridicule, I guess, a lot more scoffing, mm -hmm. uh, but I think hopefully the approach I took with the book, which is, you know, huge amounts of research, a uh, huge attempt at thinking clearly and concisely about what all of this could possibly mean and how it could fit the main environment that we all know and live in. Um, I think that approach has helped uh, make people consider it differently who, and they, you know, I, I think uh, the article in the, in the Camden Free Press, uh, he, when I talked to him, when he interviewed me, he said that my publisher had sent him a few books as they usually do about local history stuff. And he'd gone through the stack and he got to my book and he was just sort of like, yeah, right. You know, and tossed it aside. But then he picked it up again later and started reading it and actually got really interested. Um, so, so I think it's really exciting that people are willing to uh, engage with the topic on a serious conversational level and inquire about this stuff instead of just dismissing it. And that is a goal I hoped for, but mm -hmm. didn't actually think was necessarily gonna happen. So it's been really exciting to have people willing to consider this, um, even on a hypothetical level without just dismissing it offhandedly. So yeah, so my experience with press is usually that they try to like kind of sensationalize things and grab onto parts of the story that are scary or exciting or yeah. ridiculous. Um, and this, uh, the past month or so since the book came out has been a whole different experience for me. So it's been really exciting. Sure. Um, the next question comes from Alan again, and it says, if humans continue deforestation, where will Bigfoot retreat to? Could it go into caves or another hard to reach place or just keep moving around basically? Um, I think they already utilize caves and caverns uh, pretty frequently. Um, Maine has a lot of caves and caverns that aren't uh, generally on record. We have very few mapped caves and caverns in Maine, but we know that a lot exist. Um, but so far as deforestation goes, um, it's, I think it would be devastating. Mm -hmm. um, it would push them as far as they needed to go to get back to wooded land. Um, I talked to Peter Byrne, who's uh, a West Coast uh, investigator and has been since the 60s and 70s. Um, and he, he's, he expressed concern that he was getting less and less reports where he was because they're having extensive deforestation from lumbering um, in the areas where he researches, and he's very concerned that it's all going to go away. Mm -hmm. So that is a real threat, I think. I think that came up in the book, actually, where um, you cited some wildfires in the area, and then mm -hmm. an increase in uh, 
sightings around populated areas. So it was almost like the wildfires were driving the creatures away from the heavily forested areas towards the edges of society where they were being seen and then there was a big spike. Yes, yeah, that's um, Janelle's dad theorized that that was what was going on when yeah. everybody in their area started having encounters out of the blue when they hadn't before. Um, and I think, yeah, any, and Maine has had a few massive forest fires. Uh, it'd be interesting to see, um, I think the other really, really big one was in the, was it the late 40s. I'm gonna have to look that up. I should know that better. Joyce Butler did a great book about it. <laughs> um, but that fire basically swept through Southern Maine and just devastated acres and acres and acres of, um, of land. And it would be interesting to dig through old newspapers from that era and see if any stories like that came up. Um, the reason I knew about that uh, was because I had run across an article by uh, Jean Letourneau, who was a Maine outdoors writer in the 60s and 70s. And he was hearing stories from people in some very remote areas around the time of the late Mox Lake Moxie fires. And uh, I think there was another one right up near Katahdin at the same time um, that destroyed a lot of acreage. Um, and he was hearing reports from people in these little out tiny outpost towns in that region of something that was bigger than a bear, that mm. was not a bear, that was showing up uh, because of being pushed out of those areas by the fire. Um, and, and one of the reasons I, I do know that there are a bunch of main caves beyond additional research I've done is um, that uh, one of the theories Jean Latourneau mentioned was that there had been a bunch, there were a bunch of caverns and caves up near Katahdin that had probably been being utilized by, you know, black bears and possibly other large mammals that had then been cut off from those because of the fire. So. Um, so Tom Francois and Tristan kind of asked the same question. So I'm going to paraphrase both of them together. Um, has there been research into if there's multiple species or clans of Bigfoot in America and Canada? And then Tom asks, is there a difference between West Coast and East Coast sightings? And could that be related to multiple species of Bigfoot? I think there are, gauging from descriptions, there are some variations uh, depending on where, what region uh, the encounter is happening. Uh, the people I've talked to in Maine seem to run across uh, creatures that are like that sort of orangutan kind of orangey red, like an auburn kind of color mm -hmm. or a much darker, almost black color. Um, but I know there are a lot, there's, and some of them have uh, reported, there's like a little bit of gray mixed in as well. Uh, but I know, I, I'm trying to remember, there, there are other people who have regional specialty and know their region's uh, type much better and there are differences uh, in darkness of color uh, between south and north and there's there are some investigators that have theories about why those uh, variations in, in appearance occur. Uh, there are also uh, size differences uh, and it, probably a lot of that has to do with you know resources that are available. Mm -hmm. um, to, for nutrition and, and, and for, you know, staying hidden well, like, you know, who survives better, a big bulky creature or something that's a little more alive that can, you know, step between the trees really well. So, so there's no reason to think there aren't variations in, uh, in Bigfoot, just as there would be in, you know, black bears, there's a wide variety of, of coat tones, depending on what region you're in. So. Yeah, it's, it would be interesting to see a really good study of that done, because it's a question yeah. I get asked a lot. And I'm, I'm sure there's varying accounts even within regions. I mean, I'm sure it's mm -hmm. not always the same exact. Yeah, and, it's, and it would be a tricky study to do without actual hair samples, because so many of the people I've talked to have said, well, the hair looked like this color, but it was being backlit. So I don't know what color it was actually. Yeah. So, so there's light is a huge factor in description of the, the coat tone or color. It's a huge factor. 
Yeah, and especially yeah, sun and light and any anything like that could affect it to the point where it wouldn't be even distinguishable. Um, Info asks, what is the life cycle of Bigfoot, e.g., gestational period, length of life, etc.? Have there been any studies, any uh, <clears throat> anyone looked into that or have any conjectures about it? Uh, I think there are a fair number of people who are interested in it and probably some of the people who are habituators, as I mentioned before, who are spending a long period of time studying a particular group in a particular area um, might have better ideas about that than I do. Um, I know that the people I've talked to who have encountered family groups, uh, sometimes it's just one youngster. Mm -hmm. uh, other times it's multiples. Um, the York County uh, encounter in the book is, there was a very distinctive family group because he, they figured it was the adult female, the mother who was there with the youngsters who were much smaller and there were three of them, um, if I'm remembering correctly. And then there were at least one, possibly two mid-sized ones. So probably like the you know, late adolescent, early adult, not quite fully grown ones who are kind of working the periphery. And then the much larger male who is the, uh, the patriarch of the family as well. So I think, you know, like any other species, there are going to be patterns in how the family ages and breaks up into separate factions and goes and finds its way out in the woods while some other members remain in the general area of where they were raised. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I would love to see, I would love to see a really comprehensive uh, account of how that all pans out. And I suspect, you know, like, like any family, there's probably <laughs> many different variations to the formula. Yeah, you have your, um, your basketball players of the Bigfoot. Uh, <laughs> land and you have your really centigenarians and then you have people who don't make it past 40. So yeah, would, I'm sure there's a lot of variation within the species as well. Mm -hmm. um, Alan asked, are we overthinking this mystery? Are scientists discounting Bigfoot stories and could our mindset be the one pivotal reason why we aren't solving this yet? Uh, it, that it very well could be. Uh, I mean, the fact that with the exception of a few, a very small handful of scientists who are willing to take a certain amount of risk with their career um, mm -hmm. to look into this publicly, uh, there are probably a lot of scientists who would be more interested and more willing to engage with the topic if they knew it wasn't going to cost them everything they'd worked for all the years building up their career. So I think it's, I think the public perception is shifting. And I think the institutional and academic attitude is going to be a much longer haul to adjust. So okay. it, it would be, it would be nice if everything kind of moved forward together, but we humans are very stubborn and we uh, many, <laughs> many humans just really aren't interested in change and will do anything they can to, to stymie it, unfortunately. Um, so the next question is from Sarah, but it's actually from Jeff, who is driving and listening. I don't know how he got the question to Sarah, but <laughs> thank you for not typing while driving. Um, and he asks, would you think the main Bigfoot is the same species with the same lifespan as, say, the wood booger of Virginia? And I think you might have just wanted to say wood booger. <laughs> I have heard of these wood boogers or, uh, or woolly <laughs> boogers, as some people call them. Yeah, um, it's entirely possible. Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, the, you know, I've, I've said it a million times, but the, the political boundaries of, you know, states and countries aren't going to apply to, you know, animals and creatures in the woods. Um, so there's no reason why there wouldn't be a full sprawl of the same species all up and down the eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. I mean, humans did it. Why, <laughs> why not? You know? Um, yeah. And with, you know, variations in, uh, hair color or length or thickness depending on the differences in environment where they are so yeah that's entirely reasonable to to imagine that or to extrapolate that okay 
Um, Info asks, second question from our group, are they patriarchal or matrilineal, matri matriarchal societies? I messed up my uh, big fancy words there for a second. <laughs> Um, I think it seems like it's a, from the people I've talked to who have had multiple encounters, it seems like a cooperative venture uh, between the maternal and paternal uh, parts of the family. But the one pattern that's emerged is that the, the fully grown male, the patriarch of the family roams a lot. Um, in search of food, one can only assume. Um, so the, the males tend to kind of uh, revolve outwards uh, geographically um, and do loops uh, through, you know, probably various regions where they know there are resources that they can bring back for the rest of the family group. Um, so I think that the matriarch of the family is generally uh, somewhere safer with the younger members of the family, which is you know similar to a lot of other creatures in the natural world. Um, that seems to be the the general pattern that's emerged from what people have noticed. But there doesn't seem to be, you know, visible submissiveness on the part of the female. So I think it it's, they each have their own roles, but it doesn't seem to be uh, a huge imbalance of power, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Tom Francois brings up a question that is addressed in the book a little bit, and they say, tool making or not? Hmm. Um, I have talked to people who, um, have seen, I, I think trees are the most readily available tool, uh, trees and rocks, and they are definitely used for various functions, um, whether it's signaling to other members of their group or other passers-by um, audibly or by weaving uh, manipulated trees in certain positions to signal uh, passage. So I would have to say tool using, but not to an extreme degree. It seems to be based on convenience and necessity. It's not an ambitious use of tools. Um, not the way, you know, humans are hell bent on constantly uh, improving and uh, evolving what they're doing with them. It seems to be a pretty standard use. Um, I'd be curious to hear if there are any accounts out there where people have had you know, major surprises of that sort, but from what I can tell, it's not, it's not a huge part of their focus to, to technologically advance. Okay, um, I had a question that I wanted to throw out as well, which was, could you talk a little bit about Nathaniel Brislin's uh, documentary, Eyes from the Pines, that's coming out, I believe it's, is it coming out next month? Yes, yeah, July, I believe, is when he was shooting for to have it finally in the can and out on DVD, so, but he could not give me a definite date. I think he's as anxious as everybody else for it to be out. <laughs> so um, I think I kind of drove a little crazy when I was like, when's it coming out? <laughs> so um, I have not seen it. Mm -hmm. um, I know he's been uh, working a lot, both with uh, talking to eyewitnesses, but also going out and uh, doing expeditions on his own with friends where they experimented with things like using pheromones as bait and things like that to try to get responses. So um, I'm really curious to see what he has developed over the last few years because he's been working on it for, yeah, it's been at least three years, probably more like four, I would guess. So, so hopefully he's accumulated a lot of really interesting stuff uh, for us to check out. Yep. Um, okay, so we are past eight. We can take a few more questions. Um, 
But Tom asks again, scavengers or hunters? Has there been any evidence of them actually hunting or are they more? Yeah, I would, I would say probably a mix. I think, um, uh, you know, like the black bears, uh, to use a good analog, they're opportunists. Uh, and it depends on what's available in a region at a particular time of the year. There are accounts, uh, not people that I've talked to, um, but there are accounts of uh, seeing them carrying small animals that which they're obviously about to use for food. Uh, so I think that they definitely take uh, advantage of available protein sources, uh, rabbits, smaller deer, stuff like that. Um, I know Mike Ledbury um, in his account mentioned finding um, a spot on one of the trails where something had killed a grouse and there was a stick which had uh, blood and feathers on it. So, um, and he thought maybe that was, uh, that might have been one of them that had done that and either, you know, used the stick for helping to pull parts of it apart. I have no idea, but um, there definitely seem to be reports of both uh, scavenging and hunting. Uh, Susie mentioned that they really like the uh, dead fish and stuff that they found at the bottom of, if they found dead fish at the lake that she lived by. Um, they seem to like the gaminess of the meat and savored it a lot. So, um, so sca scavenging is definitely part of the picture of, according to, to the eyewitnesses I've spoken to as well. Um, they, I think they have a really wide ranging diet like black bears uh, taking uh, any opportunity they can to, to get the nutrition they need from what's around them. There are reports of them eating algae um, and uh, you know, I can only imagine that there's lots of other stuff that they're eating that that we don't know about because it doesn't leave a, an appreciable mark on the environment. So we would never know, same as bears. Although bears sometimes <laughs> leave plenty of marks. So I don't know. Okay, and um, the last question, which I wanted to ask was, I've always been obsessed with Bigfoot hoaxes. Some of them have been pretty elaborate. I remember back in 2008, 2009, I was all in on the Georgia Bigfoot. I thought it was for real. Um, these guys said that they had a cooler or a chest freezer full of ice with a Bigfoot in it, and they were going to reveal it, and it was going to be the coming out party for Bigfoot in the real world. And it ended up just being, I think it was like just something with hair on it. It was it was not convincing at all with like some guts thrown in it, I think. From yeah, yeah. It was a Jackson bad, from, bad, uh, bad yeah. scene. Um, have you run into any hoaxes in any of your research? And what's your opinion of Bigfoot hoaxes? Do you have any good stories or um, anything that fascinated you until they proved to be completely false? Well, I mean, we're all still wrangling over the Patterson Gimlin footage. So, <laughs> so that will probably never be fully solved, but it's intriguing enough that it has persisted and is held up as, you know, one of the best uh, documented proofs of Bigfoot. Um, uh, I don't think I've necessarily, if I've run across any hoaxes, they were just so obvious that I didn't even, mm -hmm. <laughs> I shouldn't even start a discussion with them. Um, and, uh, I think I was lucky enough that the people I talked to were all very earnest about what their encounter what had happened during their encounter and how it affected them. And they're, they were not trying to put forward uh, anything that didn't actually happen. Uh, most of them went out of their way to be very clear um, about the fact that they didn't notice such and such. Uh, they, you know, they didn't want to add in any extra details that they didn't know for sure. They were all very clear about how much they had or hadn't observed. Um, and so I think I was very lucky in the people that I spoke to, um, both those who I reached out to and the people who reached out to me, um, oftentimes through word of mouth from, from other people. So, um, but there are definitely hoaxers out there. Um, it creates a real, 
virulent reaction within the serious Bigfoot community. Um, I'm on one message board and anytime anybody comes on and even gives a hint that they might be involved in hoaxing, uh, simply by even just bringing up the topic, they, got shut, they get shut down immediately. Um, I think the general consensus in the really serious Bigfoot world is not to give these people any form to speak in, not to give them any information that they can duplicate. And um, the problem is there will always be jokers out there, people mm -hmm. who you know, want to see how far they can take it. Um, you know, I, I have a friend who um, made a, a really, actually a really good uh, feature film called Mud, um, in which the father figure in the film had a whole like museum in his garage about this monster that he'd encountered and all this other stuff. And uh, it's a really great little film that was done here in Maine. And, uh, and my friend who made the film basically said to me at one point, if you ever have anybody come and try to tell you about the Porter Bog Man, that's just a story I made up when I was a kid, <laughs> you know? So there's, you know, everybody likes to start a story. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not just kids, it's, it's adults too. So, so there, there's plenty of jokesters out there. There's a few chapters or sections in the book which deal with uh, the ways that various versions of the Bigfoot legend have been used or abused in Maine over the years uh, by people who were who had sometimes very peculiar goals in mind so it the the hoaxing oftentimes makes absolutely no sense um there, there was it, one where he was trying to become famous in music or yeah, yeah. yeah he wanted Maury Povich to pay attention to him oh yeah <laughs> you know just uh, I really wish I could have gotten a hold of that guy to talk to him too. <laughs> yeah, that would be as fascinating as any of the other accounts. I mean, obviously in a different way, but yeah, your gold yeah. from a story standpoint, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a the hoaxster personality is is very interesting. I yeah. mean, there's always going to be a trickster out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that was one of the things that really struck me about the book is that all of the people you interviewed, they're not attention seeking really i mean even um janelle who has the or sorry susie who has the documentary about her she was very reluctant to you know talk to anyone about it and she it seemed like even her story had been kind of twisted around so these aren't people that are trying to get famous trying to get rich yeah they're honest stories from real people who've seen something so well michelle thank you for coming this has been great i could talk all night but i'm gonna have to cut it off um, <laughs> It's great. I don't know about you, but for me, it's great to get paid to uh, talk about Bigfoot. <laughs> I really have to soak it in. This is probably the one time I'm going to be able to do this. So um, until thank you volume again. two comes out. Yeah, that's true. We'll do a follow up. Uh, Bigfoot in Maine is out now through the History Press. I would suggest everyone read it. And we do have a copy here at the library, or you can buy them on Amazon. And or, it's a great or, book. or you can buy them um, at oh, yeah. Yeah. greenhandbookshop.com and I'll sign them for you yeah. happily I'm, for no extra charge. So. <laughs> I'm sorry to promote Amazon when we have a real <laughs> local bookstore owner in our presence. Um, Jeff Bezos doesn't need any more money. Please give your money to small local businesses. He doesn't need it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's been great talking to you and good luck with the book. I hope everything goes well. Good luck with the continued research. Thank you. And hope to hear from you soon when the next book comes out. So wonderful. I'll, I'll keep working hard on it. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks everyone for showing Thanks, up. Everybody. Have a good evening. Have a good evening.